Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today we're going to be talking about what to do when someone in your family leaves the church. Yeah, it's a really painful situation when your husband, your wife, your child, your grandchild leaves the church, and we're joined with Brandon Vaught to talk about how to get them to return. Yeah, it's it's one of the most important things, you know, when we realize how much we love our family members, you know, that love is expressed for, perfectly in family worship. Yep. So let's reunite the family. Great to be joined today with Brandon. Welcome again. It's always good to see you and hear from you. No, delighted to be back, guys. I'm I'm still I still got the tight grip on my most prominent guest title, right? <laughs> I, I, this this is number five. You're starting to run away with it. <laughs> this is, I mean, you're starting to look like it's like Babe Ruth in the dead ball era. You got yeah. sixty, and everyone else got like twelve. Yeah, and yeah. Jordan Wildwood from everything Catholic has no chance to catch up. I don't think he's he's, he's, uh, he's the he's, second. Is he's it neck and there. neck? He's he's, a, he's a, all right, Brandon. You got yeah. somebody on your tail. Yeah. <laughs> Keep that grip tight. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a really important episode, and this is one that uh, impacts so many people. Oh, yeah, and our sure. listeners ask this all the time. They ask our advice because they look to us as people, you know, in the church who know a thing or two, and they say, well, my so-and-so, my, my husband doesn't want to go to church with me. My son no longer will attend a church. He went to college, and my daughter's now not going to Mass anymore. My grandchild, which is a particularly painful. Oh, it's one. just so hard, yeah, pastorally yeah. speaking. I hear that all the time, and you and you see it in these beautiful grandmothers' eyes, and they're crying and they're sharing with you, Father. You know, like my yeah. my children don't practice. My my grandchildren aren't being raised Catholic. They haven't even been baptized. It is. It's heartbreaking. You know, for every one person that enters the church, six leave. Mm. That's crazy. Yeah. That's a hemorrhage. This That's is a, an alarming statistic. And that means that, look, if you've got a family, someone in your family has left the church and no longer practicing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we all have yeah. it. I mean, I, I'm yeah. already kind of listing them in my in my own 100%. head. And and hopefully this show can hopefully contextualize uh, something that could be fruitful in my own personal family. Yeah. So, Brandon, uh, if you would, introduce yourself and, you know, let everyone know how it is that you're, you know, really so qualified to talk on this issue. Yeah, so uh, my name is Brandon Vaught. I'm a convert to the Catholic Church. I entered the, the church when I was in college at a time when most of my peers were walking out the back door. So I came in the front as they were all leaving. Um, and it perturbed me because I, I had discovered all of this truth and goodness and beauty that I was drawn to. And I, I wondered, why are so many people leaving? Did, did they not see the same things I have? Do they know something I don't? Um, so that got me talking to a lot of young 20 and 30 somethings who were raised Catholic and are no longer Catholic today. And I, I began hearing similar things from them about why they, they drifted away from the church. So it became a, a, a key interest in my life. And I started writing about it, speaking about it. Eventually, I wrote a whole book on the topic. It's called Return, How to Draw Your Child Back to the Church. Um, I published my own version of the book and it quickly went viral. It sold 50,000 copies in the first few months. And then um, about a year or two ago, Word on Fire, the Bishop Robert Barron's ministry for which I work, um, then released a second new edition. And there was a whole nother wave of, of interest in this question. In compiling the book, I did a couple things to, to get a sense of why people are leaving and what actually works to draw them back. So the first thing I did was study all the surveys of people who are disaffiliated from the Catholic Church. We actually have tons of data on this. Maybe we'll get to some of it in a moment. So we don't have to guess about why people leave. They they tell us. We've, we've asked tens of thousands of them why they've left, and we have a lot of quantitative data on this. And then secondly, talk to a lot of parents, uh, grandparents, aunts, uncles, who have successfully seen their children and grandchildren return to the church and ask them, what worked? How did you do it? What was your secret? What, what, how were you able to draw someone back when so many other people are struggling? So that's what the book contains, is the fruit of, of all of this research. And it lays out a proven path for people who want to draw loved ones back to the church. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned some of those statistics and some of the, that feedback, right? And I think this is a really important thing. And this is uh, 
this is almost, you know, Thomistic is really understanding the problem and being able to state the problem better than the opponent to really be able to then counter that mm -hmm. problem, right? I mean, you can't solve a problem unless you understand it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so why are people leaving the church? What is that feedback saying? What are these reasons that people give that they disaffiliate with the church? Well, again, I mentioned we have tons of surveys on this. I, I find that people are very quick to offer their opinion of why they think people leave the church, you know, especially when it comes to young people. Oh, young people, you know, they just want to live immoral lifestyles or they are drawn to evangelical churches that have lights and smoke screens and, you know, lots of entertainment. And that's why they've left the Catholic church. But when we talk to people who have actually left, those reasons usually don't pop up. I'll tell you what the top reasons given are. The, the best survey we have of this was a, um, a Pew Research Center study polled about 30,000 former Catholics and asked them uh, which of these reasons led to you leaving the church. So they could select multiple, so the numbers don't add up to 100%. But here were some of the top reasons. So the number one reason people gave, 80, or excuse me, 68% of people cited this, they said their spiritual needs were not being met. Second, 67% uh, said they just lost interest. They just became ambivalent about religion. 48% um, said they no longer believe. And that one's interesting to me because in, in other surveys from the CARA Institute and from dioceses that have commissioned the, their exit surveys, that one is always in the top two or three, that people no longer believe. Now, you can unpack that how you will. We don't know what they mean by that. Do they mean they no longer believe in God? They no longer believe in Christ or the sacraments or the church? But to me, that that gets to the heart of something important, which is we're not only dealing with emotional frustration or, or spiritual inadequacy. This is an intellectual problem in large part that there's a large number of people who were raised Catholic but just don't believe in what the church is, is offering them. They're just going through the motions. Maybe their parents took them to mass. They kind of went along. But by the time they got to college, they stopped going. And the big reason is because they don't believe in all this stuff. So all of that data, I think, is important for people hoping to draw people back to the church. Mm. Yeah, I like what you said there. And I think that's really important to know because it's so easy to dismiss someone, especially when they leave your camp. They're like, hey, you're no longer one of us. Oh, you left the church? Well, yeah, you'd probably just want to go out and do terrible things. You want to go and, you know, sleep around and do drugs and kick puppies. But that's not what's really happening, you know, but that's an easy way to dismiss it. And it dismisses the problem so you don't have to actually address what's going on. Mm -hmm. What they're actually saying is, I don't believe in this gospel. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that I have to do this stuff to be happy. Mm -hmm. I don't believe I have to do this stuff to be good. I don't believe I have to do this stuff for any reason whatsoever. Yeah, it's a, no. it's a, uh, I did a study on leadership uh, about 15 years ago. Uh, the military actually did a really big study on that. And um, it, there's a lot of similarities in, um, in the impact of people who are in positions of leadership that they've been through something before that they believe and they have a passion about it. And so the, the response to leadership was... Uh, immensely higher through that study when they felt mm -hmm. like or thought that, you know, this person who is leading them has done this before, mm -hmm. uh, believes in what he's doing. That's how that was born. You know, something out of out of leadership recently, I, I led the community through a seven week prayer preparation through Lexio Divina and just teaching mm -hmm. the principles of Lexio mm -hmm. Divina. And each week we very actively listened to the word of God and, and I printed out journals and it's like, we're doing this, you know, we're going to learn this practice together. And it's been revolutionary for people's spiritual lives. And I'm sitting there thinking of people generally speak saying, you know, I'm spiritually, spiritually malnourished, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I come to mass and I'm not being spiritually met or, and, and I think it comes down to catechesis and formation. And what I'm hearing as a result of that seven week preparation, there were many people that there were not many people. There were probably a handful of people that said, this isn't Catholic. And they went to star of the sea or they went over like to the neighboring parish, but you know, in greater respect, you know, the, the amount of emails that I have, like 
thank you so much. I attend mass so differently now and I'm paying attention to the readings and I'm getting so much more out of them yeah. and I'm listening to the scriptures. So I, I think it's like kind of bridging that in the form of leadership that you're talking about is taking these steps that maybe uh, help people come to to integrate the liturgy and, and worship a little bit more effectively. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is personal and anecdotal, but you're talking about well, it just didn't meet my spiritual needs. That was even before I don't believe in yeah. it anymore. And that, that's you know, number one. That's number one. And I look at that and I've heard a lot of people. I've been around, man. You know, I've talked to a lot of people. And what is it that Christianity even proposes? And is that even something that the modern world even needs anymore? Look, in the first century, when everyone lived under subjugation and the Roman Empire was a slave state and most people lived in the most abject poverty, and that was just normal. And a soldier can come along, take your house quarter, take your wife, do whatever. You know, and that there was a strict caste system. Okay, well, we're all created equal and that we're all going to get a paradise and we're going to get to eat in heaven in an eternal feast. Sign me up. Yeah. But hey, man, no one's knocking down my door. I can eat all that I want, and I got anything I want on demand. I'm living in essentially what most of these people would look like as a paradise. Mm -hmm. If you took someone from the first century, dropped them into our studio right now, they're like, am this I in heaven? Palazzo, yeah. Am I in heaven? Mm -hmm. You have all this food and these lights, and mm -hmm. you're safe. So does the proposition of Christianity even meet the modern need? And yes, it does. But the way it's being presented, the way... The, the, the particular charisms of Christianity that are being presented are not answering the questions that people are asking. We're still answering take. questions that no one's asking anymore. Yeah. No, that's an interesting take. And, you know, Brandon, as, as you really, uh, I mean, you've written a book and it's outstanding and I've shared it with my parish. And I just want to say thank you because the work that you all do with Word on Fire and your content, and uh, it's always a joy to have you on the show. So, deliberating over this first one in particular, because I'm obviously very invested as a, as a pastor, as a priest, I really want people to be spiritually nourished when they come to mass. As you deliberated it over it, studied it further, what were some of the things you took out of that first, uh, that first one? Yeah, you mean like how would I respond? To yeah, people how would who you respond to it? Like, how do you nursed? read that statistic? How do you read that uh, response of the people? Yeah, what it tells me is that a lot of people, a lot of Catholics, born and raised in the church, baptized, you know, confirmed, uh, going through all the sacraments, still don't have a great understanding of what Christianity exists for. Why did Christ come to die? It wasn't so that once a week you could go into a building with a lot of friends and hear a TED talk and some nice music, uh, which I think is how a lot of people view church is. If I show up and it's a boring homily with bad music, I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm not being spiritually fed. Um, but we Catholics have a much different understanding of what the purpose of the spiritual life is. You know, the church fathers like to say that God became man so that man could become God. The whole purpose of the spiritual life is deification. It's to draw us up into the divine life of God. And Christ has helped us to do this by giving us sacraments, primarily the sacrament of the Eucharist and confession. And so there's no better way to be fed spiritually than by receiving Christ in the Eucharist and by receiving his forgiveness in the confessional. So those are the lines I, I try to help people walk. Um, you know, usually when I hear someone say, well, I wasn't being spiritually fed in the Catholic church, I'll say, well, what do you mean by that? What were you looking for that you didn't find? And usually it's something like, well, they didn't, you know, preach the Bible or, you know, I found this other church that has amazing Bible studies and small groups and communities. And, you know, the, the Sunday services are alive and vibrant. The music's amazing. All those are good things. And yes, we Catholics should pick up our game in all those areas. We should have resplendent music. We should have, you know, incredibly deep studies of the Bible. We should have small groups and communities. But all of that is, is in some ways the appetizer to the main way that Christ wants to feed us, which is through himself. He wants to give us himself, and he does that in the Eucharist, and you're not going to find that in another Christian community as good as it is. Uh, so that's what you're leaving when you leave the Catholic Church. You're leaving the primary source of nourishment Christ wants to give you. You know, so I view that as a lateral move or, you know, lateral and down, but it's like, okay, I'm leaving the church for another church. But how many of those people who aren't spiritually nourished 
become nuns. They disaffiliate with all organized religion, and they just become spiritual. Because I think within all of these categories, you have a bifurcation of what's happening. What's the outcome? I'm leaving the church because of this. Yeah. Where did you go? Mm -hmm. Because where you went, I think, informs the character of what your response is. Mm -hmm. I left because I wasn't being nourished, so I went over to the Lutherans. Okay. Now we're talking about a dis difference in doctrine or practice, not a necessarily of faith. But if you go to nuns, well, that, that's a completely different problem to solve. So I think it's important to look at those, you know. So, Brandon, like, when people are leaving, you know, how many are becoming nothing, nuns? They just, I don't believe anymore versus, you know, I'm non-denominational, right? Because I, I think that's a big distinction. Yeah, and again, we have tons of data on this, so we don't have to guess. The surveys show that about half of Catholics who leave the church end up as nuns, N-O-N-E-S, meaning they leave Catholicism for no other religion. They just don't have a religious faith anymore. Now, this doesn't mean that they stop believing in God, doesn't mean they necessarily stop praying, but they no longer associate with any church or religion. So about half of people who leave become nuns. About a quarter of Catholics who leave the church become some version of evangelical Protestant, and then another quarter is a mishmash of other mainline uh, Protestant traditions, other faiths, other religions, etc. But by and large, today, most people who leave reject religion altogether. Now, that's important to realize because that's a very different trend than what we would have found, let's say, 10 or 20 years ago. Maybe 20 years ago, if you had a family member who left the Catholic Church, the chances would still be pretty good that they would have just switched to another Christian church. They would have started going to the non-denominational church down the road or you know, some mainline tradition. But not today. If someone, if you meet someone who said they were raised Catholic, but they're no longer Catholic anymore, and you had to guess what their religious identification is, you the, the odds would be more likely than not that they no longer have any religion. So I think uh, what we're what I'm hearing is that there is a, a process of understanding um, where your nourishment comes from. Uh, then there's also the understanding that people don't understand the, the, the Eucharist as that nourishment. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there's been some studies on, you know, belief in the Eucharist. Where, where is that? Is it like half, half of the Catholics? <sighs> it's worse than that. I, I, like, I think like, Bishop Barry just released a video on this, right? Yeah, I, it was the Pew Research study, study from a year and a half ago, and it found that 69% of Catholics believe that the Eucharist is just a symbol. So less than a third of Catholics believe that it's truly the body and blood of Jesus. And it's similar to, you know, the the sense of what I surveyed at the parish um, just by raising of hands, um, like how many of you believe that Jesus Christ is fully God? You know, and like only like a quarter of 10%, a quarter, you know, like people raising their hands and across these, all these masses, you know, it's like- Good people. Gr great people. But I, again, I just think it's a crisis of catechesis. Mm, it's yeah. a crisis of culture, you know, and there, and, you know, look at us. We went, we were, we were cradle Catholics, right? Yeah. We went to CCD. We were public school kids. Did you pay attention at CCD? Like, was it like... I got straight days. You got straight <laughs> days? <laughs> I did not. <laughs> but, you know, it, it wasn't... Uh, that, that's why I really look to the converts of the faith, and I say this to my converts all the time because they are super active. They're tithing 10%. They're all in, you know, <laughs> because they've learned the faith. I see the, the reform of the church. I see that sense of, like, um, renewal in church practice and educating cat and catechizing through the converts like well, it's, it's like Brandon and you, it's a it's a perfect example Brandon and, and how articulate you are and how immersed you are in the study and how passionate you are it comes across beautifully yeah I mean they've mm -hmm. made an intellectual study and an intellectual decision mm -hmm. to convert which follows from at least some studying now if you would have looked at maybe the average Catholic you know in the village in the 1400s they'd be like, yeah Jesus is God 100 percent would raise their hand not even a question so I think it's a also a thing about how society even values catechetical education anymore. Mm -hmm. They just don't care. Mm -hmm. so, you know, whatever. It's just it's not a thing that binds society so, together yeah. anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not a societal identifier. It's, there's no societal pressure to be in conformity with the faith of your community. But this is precisely why from the pulpit, in the action of the homily, we have to and I and I understand homiletics, but we need to catechize. Mm. You know, and I, I know that the homily technically is not meant to catechize, but 
it's a catechetical opportunity we can't miss because that's when we have people there. Yeah. And moving the church's ministry online in the way that Word on Fire has really championed so much of this on their own shoulders and what we do on, on, a, on a smaller scale and what other Ascension Press and Father Mike Schmitz is doing. You know, obviously, Father Mike's doing a lot better job than I am. Much but, better. But, you know, the beauty... Let's not even bring up the, the comparison with Bishop Barron. I don't even bring that up because that's like, you know... Clearly. That's clearly. like comparing pebbles and Mount Everest, right? <laughs> but the, the, the sense is, is like, brothers, you know, you are a public person. Oh, I'll never get online. I'll never do anything online. No, like, you are a public person. This is the public forum. Yeah. We need not just, you know, Bishop Barron and Father Mike Schmitz. We need all ministries active, alive, online, inviting people in and sharing the beauty of the teachings of the church. You know, when I talk to ministries through our work with Fuzadi, they say, you know, we're kind of struggling and we need to start investing and in doing some marketing and getting online, you know, because otherwise we're going to go away. Otherwise we're going to fold. You know, we're already getting old. There's only, you know... The average age of our brothers is now 70 years old. But we don't want to spend too much money. We don't want to invest too much. And I'm like, when I tell them this all the time, I'm like, guys, you have a rainy day fund that you've been saving for a rainy day, but open your windows. Dude, it's pouring outside, okay? <laughs> yeah. It is the rainy day. You don't spend it now. All you're going to be doing is taking that money and leaving it to somebody in your organization or in your religious orders will, okay? It is time. It is now is the time to start making converts. Mm -hmm. There is no waiting. There, this is the rainy day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and that calling that I had in the seminary, mm -hmm. um, and then began with Fuzati. That it was a uh, it was a desert out there. Mm -hmm. Like I don't even think you had written your book with Bishop Barron or with, with the digital age at, even at that time. Mm -hmm. And I get this calling, and I'm looking around because I was a marketer, and Fuzati was a secular company. And, and I remember this call, and I'm looking online, and I'm going, nobody's doing this. Yeah. I mean, it was, there was like, I don't know, when I was in the seminary, there was Scott Hahn, there was a few other guys, and then they would write books, and that was it. And then Lighthouse Media came out. I think Lighthouse, Lighthouse was like the first thing that yeah. I, I remember from memory. CDs. Yeah, yeah. CDs. And, and, mm -hmm. then, um, and then now look at it, the, there's, there are... There are the church is the laity in the church in a big way is sort of taking this upon themselves. And we moved from CDs to DVDs. DVDs right? And now we're just doing YouTube. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> it's crazy. I'm, I'm interested. Okay. So this research obviously opened up. I, I remember reading some of that, at least in the Kara Institute opens up to a whole plethora of information. What, what did you use to ascertain what you wanted to put in this book because I, I knew you, I, I know you would probably want to use something that you could present the solution with. So what else did you learn? And then how did that inspire you to begin this process of helping men and women draw their family members back? Great question. Well, yeah, again, it all started with these studies, which were all rolling out in the mid, uh, let's say, last decade or so. Um, so I started reading all these, started talking to former Catholics, talking to family members of those who have effectively drawn their their family members back and just kind of had this epiphany that this is from what I hear from priests all the time, Father Rich alluded earlier, the number one thing priests hear, priests keep telling me, you know, oh, I can't tell you how many parents, grandparents come to me just in despair over their, their children, grandchildren who have drifted away from the faith. So a major problem, maybe the top two or three problems in the church and there hasn't been a lot of resources. There's been a lot of complaining, griping, musing over what's causing this, but not a lot of, of proactive strategies to say, well, what are we going to do to reverse this trend? Um, so that's where this book emerged from. And it starts off by analyzing some of these national surveys. But a point that I hammer home in the book is all of that is just sort of to contextualize where your particular loved one might be coming from. But I have a whole chapter in the book helping parents and grandparents to hone in on why that particular person has left the church. Again, we don't want to just assume, well, they've left because of X, Y, or Z, and then responding to those reasons might be responding to things that are, just aren't issues for that person. We need to understand why they left the church. And so I've guided readers in some simple conversations uh, to ascertain that. So you, you want to ask things like, hey, you know, I, I know you were raised Catholic, you know, we took you to mass every Sunday. And I, I know after you went off to school, 
you no longer go to mass anymore. And so I'm just curious, you know, I, I want to understand better what what changed for you? Why why is the faith no longer attractive to you? Maybe it never was, you know, and I, I'd be curious to know that too. But let the other person share with you in their own words where they stand on God, faith, spirituality, the church. And then you have something to work with. Then you have something to to respond to over the coming months or maybe years. Um, so that's how I begin the book. That's basically the first section of the book. And then the whole rest of the book is a game plan. In fact, there's seven steps that I propose, again, based on hundreds of successful stories of people who have come back to the church, seven steps that you need to walk down to lead someone back to the church. And they include things like praying and fasting for the other person, uh, starting religious conversations, equipping yourself, so preparing yourself to talk about the reasons that they've left the church, how to start and open conversations about the faith, how to move the dialogue forward eventually to the point where you invite them to come back to the church. I share with people exactly how to do that. And then finally, how do you close the loop? How do you get them to make a commitment where they've intentionally decided, you know what, I, I really want to come back. I want to reunite with the church. I want to come to mass. I want to know Christ. Um, so I, the whole book walks through that that path for parents and grandparents. I mean, the whole premise of love and listening is based on this sense of asking these questions, because when the question isn't asked, it creates a chasm. And then that chasm, when it's not addressed, it just creates a disease in the heart. And you get the sadness, the despair, the despondency of our, of our patriarchs, our matriarchs, the people who have received the faith, they've lived the faith, and now they're seeing it dying in the next generation. Mm -hmm. It's such, it, it is a chasm, but it's, it doesn't have to be, you know, like, opening up these conversations, have these conversation tips. Brandon, what a gift that you've given to the church, especially to our to our brothers and sisters. And then especially our generation as we're looking at, you know, raising our kids and, and coming to potentially some days where we too may be seeing some of our kids not practicing. Yeah. You know, I just want to say as a pastor and a priest, <laughs> thank you for putting this together. You know, I, I think it's so remarkable that it's such an easy thing to do and just listen but it's so hard to do and actually practice it. You know, that's the first response is just listen. But most people, that is not their first inclination, you know. Uh, and that's a really that's a really insightful and a and, uh, powerful thing for people who are trying to maybe help those people who have went away from the churches. Hey, first thing is just listen, understand the problem. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to mention real quick before we get back into the conversation. Now, stick around for the rest of this episode because at the end of it, Brandon is going to tell you how that he, you can get this book 100% free, how you can get this book return that has sold probably over 100,000 copies at this point. You're going to be able to get this 100% free. So I want you to stick around to the end of the episode about that. Now, one of the things that I always think is, is really, it hurts me reading. Okay? It's like, we'll go somewhere and say, hey, give us your prayer petitions because we're going to go pray for you, like when we go on a pilgrimage. And I'll look at them, and they'll say one of two things. Pray for me, I'm sick, or pray for my child or grandchild. That is, out of all prayer petitions, those are the two. I'm sick mm -hmm. or my grandchild has left. Mm -hmm. And it really hurts me when I see grandkids because there's this generational divide, right? You start, they start getting further and further away from the faith that was so normative when the, you know, the older generation was growing up, and now you're looking at the difference between, you know, growing up in 1940 Cleveland versus 2023 in Los Angeles. Those are different worlds, right? Mm -hmm. And these older folks, they can't understand the difference between, well, of, of course, you go to church, and that's what you do. And these people are like, Grandma, it's 2023. We're on TikTok now. We're, we're shaking our ass when we dance around, and that's mm -hmm. life, right? Mm -hmm. There's a big difference. There's a generational divide. So, Brandon, how do you maybe... How do people bridge that generational divide, either between parents and children or, or grandchildren and grandparents? Yeah, one sort of counterintuitive proposal I make in the book is, let's say you're a parent or grandparent, you're trying to draw uh, a child or grandchild back to the faith. It may not be you who's the one that God uses to do this. I, I share the story of St. Monica and St. Augustine, you know, the famous story we all know of this mother who had this kind of wild, out of control child. He was living with his girlfriend. He got pregnant, uh, kind of experimenting with different religions and worldviews. And she desperately wanted him to return to Christianity. And 
wasn't making any headway. She kept talking about Christianity with him, kept, he kept getting agitated and frustrated and ignoring her. Finally, uh, Augustine travels to Milan. Monica follows him there. And while in Milan, Monica meets with the great St. Ambrose. And she's complaining to Ambrose, you know, my son, my son, I wish he would come to the faith. And, and Ambrose said, well, what have you tried? And she explained, you know, I've, I've tried everything. I've tried to preach to him. I've tried to coax him and convince him and argue with him. And then that's when Ambrose gave her some good advice, which is perhaps you should speak more to God about Augustine than to Augustine about God. And so he encouraged her to pray. And so she started praying, spent many years praying, not weeks, not months, years uh, praying for Augustine. Finally, um, through her prayers, Ambrose became the one to draw Augustine into the faith and eventually baptize him. And Ambrose has this great line. Um, he said to, to Monica, surely the son of so many tears will not perish it wasn't her words that did it. It was her heartfelt prayer that was marked by copious tears that reached God and allowed God to use the instrument of Ambrose. And so long-winded uh, parallel to, I think, what a lot of adults today might have to go through. Perhaps the, your prayer to God is that he sends an Ambrose for the young person in your life. It, it might not be you. You're right. You might not be able to relate to a gener generation or two generations away from yourself. You just don't understand the world they're in, the world they're coming from, the struggles they have. But beg God that he sends someone else to them, maybe a friend, maybe another family member, maybe they meet someone. Um, I've heard stories, and in fact, I, I share a few of them in the book here, where parents have done just that. Their, their son, daughter goes off to college, drifts away from the face, stops going to mass, gets involved with the party lifestyle, and they're they're stuck. They don't know what to do. They, they don't listen to me. They don't want to hear from me. And so they began praying for someone to meet them and rescue them from that situation. And it ends up being a classmate, someone in the college campus ministry, uh, a priest, uh, uh, you know, an, a, an adult that they work with. Somehow God uses different instruments to draw people to him. So um, that's counterintuitive advice, I think, because we're all activists. We want to do something ourselves to fix this problem. But perhaps we need the Monica path, you know, which is to ask God to use another instrument to draw our loved one back to the church. Yeah. Um, you know, just thinking about families uh, and, and, and more research, the research of, of how children maintain faith through the, their father faithfully practicing. Um, is there anything that uh, kind of addresses that? Because it seems like the women are the ones who are upset that the kids are not in the church by and large, mm -hmm. right? It, it does to me. When I hear these stories, it generally speaking comes from women. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything that, that you mentioned uh, that alludes to maybe, I don't know, like a, a, a mother uh, just talking to the father? <laughs> maybe mm -hmm. just begin, like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> It seemed like yeah, I, I do talk about that in there, and as as you say, Ryan, the correlation is extremely strong between a father practicing his faith and a young person growing up to embrace the faith themselves. We know that, uh, but w what I try to do in the book as well, though, is to caution away from things outside of your control. You know, because I, I know a lot of mothers who say, "Well, if my husband only you know took his faith seriously, then my son or daughter would." as well. You know, they see my, my spouse and they recognize, uh, you know, it's kind of hypocritical. They're making the young people go to church, but they really don't believe in it themselves. Uh, but it's usually out of our control to get our spouse to take their faith more seriously. We can do all these same things, pray for them, talk with them, help them. But I like to encourage people to focus on what can you do? What, what's in your control? And I think that also helps people to avoid the temptation to despair, which is a, a real, uh, it's a real method that the evil one uses on people who are in this situation is to cause them to just throw up their hands and say, there's nothing I can do. You know, if only my spouse had believed, but he doesn't, there's no way I can change him. If only I had raised my child differently, but I can't, so there's no hope. Um, 
there's a lot of people f- who feel as if the situation's hopeless. There's no way forward. And that's exactly what the evil one wants people in this situation to feel. So I, I try in this book also to provide uh, reasons and examples of inspiration to show people you wouldn't believe some of the cases of people who have come back to the church, how far lost they were. And if even those people come back, can come back, there's hope for your child, your grandchild. It might not happen next month. It might take a long time. It might be a circuitous route back to the church, but there's always hope. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't give into the temptation to despair. I, I follow that same path pastorally is just, you know, and, and it's, it's the path of love. Like, <clears throat> You know, you begin, you end with love. And, and how is love expressed as we're inter- interacting with our family? Listening, you know, listen deeply, you know, and, and outside of that, God is perfectly loving. He's perfectly listening to all of your prayers and investing that time as you're, as you're describing uh, in the example of, of Ambrose's, uh, St. Ambrose's encouragement to St. Monica, the shifting of the heart and our fasting and our prayer, petitioning God and talking to God about Augustine, you know, gives that sense of, I'm not going to pray in a hopeless place. I'm not going to pray in a despairing place. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pray with confidence and a hope that is beyond this world, that God who is all powerful, all loving, is going to provide this because God's love is greater than my love. And I surely love my child. And I, I desire wholeheartedly that my child would be filled with God's love. And praying out of the spirit and the vein of that type of offering before God in the spirit of fasting, my goodness, that is extremely powerful and must be the principal and most foundational aspect of where we begin. Mm-hmm. But outside of that experience <clears throat> of God listening to us in that perfect love, Realizing that we're investing all of our emotion, all of our hurt, all of our pain and our desire, our cry, resting in the fact that God receives that, we can now turn to one another with greater patience, Mm -hmm. greater compassion, greater empathy, and really not even have solutions like, okay, I've listened to you, but as you're talking, I've already formulated what I'm going to say to you to convince you to go. It's like, no, like I'm just going to walk with you and be patient with the process because the beauty of late have I loved you, O Lord, of St. Augustine, when you see that in your loved ones, man, there's nothing more tremendously magnificent than that. Yeah, I was thinking about the prodigal son, Mm -hmm. you know, how, you know, it's not detailed in the passages, but, you know, how the father must have felt to to run to him like Mm -hmm. that, to, you know, Mm -hmm. like the, just his heart and where it was at, you know. I I don't think the father could, like, like, oh, I haven't seen that guy in a while. Uh. Oh, I have forgot oh. about him. Oh, I'll yeah. just go run and have a party. I mean, yeah. that father's probably thinking about him yeah. every single pain. day, praying. Yeah. That's why you he know? ran to meet yeah, him. Yeah, because it was anticipation. <laughs> and he'd been yeah. waiting for that moment. Yeah. Now, Brandon, does this book, uh, Return, does this propose any sort of triage, right? Almost a holy triage. Because people are leaving the church for different reasons, which means they have a different position that they're starting from. So if a person leaves for X reason, Y might be the antidote, right? So... You know, if they're leaving because they're not nourished, you might do one thing. If they're leaving because of this, they might you might do another thing. Is there kind of like a, a triage system to, I guess, um, diagnose why they left and then prescribe the right treatment? Yes, is the short answer. And that's why those those early stages of trying to determine exactly why the person in front of me has drifted from the church is so important, is we, we don't want to just apply a catch-all solution that works for everyone because there isn't one. There's no silver bullet. There's no one key thing that every, if everybody did this, all young people would return to the church. You know, I think of this Pope Benedict quote. He was once asked when he was Joseph Ratzinger, um, how many different paths are there into the church? And he said, as many as there are people. And I remember thinking when I read that, you could give the same answer then about leaving the church. How many paths are there out of the church? Well, as many as there are people. Every every person has their own journey and their own reasons why they have drifted away. And so we need to figure out what are the stumbling blocks for this person? Did were they pushed away? Meaning were there were there specific things that caused them to leave the church that propelled them away from the church? Were there things that pulled them out of the church? Were there more attractive things beyond the church that um, caused them to give up on the faith? 
Once you ascertain those reasons, though, then in this book, I address a lot of the most common cases. Um, in fact, part three of the book is called The Big Objections. I think I have somewhere between 20 to 25 different typical cases or typical objections. So they're grouped into personal objections, moral objections, and then theological or spiritual objections. So these are the common ones you hear. For example, under personal objections, I just don't have time for the church right now. I'm too busy or mass is boring and irrelevant, or the church is too focused on rules and making people feel guilty. Um, I had a bad experience with the church and I'm never coming back because of that. That's just a sampling. And I have several pages devoted to each one of these typical cases, typical objections. So that's the process. You nailed it. First, figure out why did this person leave? And then after you've diagnosed that, what's the best way to help that person overcome that issue? Excellent. It's a, it's a really great resource to you know consider as we as we enter into family dynamics, but then now outside of family dynamics, we could also see as as the light is shining, we are all instruments of of mission, you know, and and we are commissioned by Christ to go out and to proclaim. And you know, when we realize the many hands laboring in the Lord's vineyard. The hope of the passing on of the faith is right here at our fingertips, yeah. and we're seeing the fruits of our labors uh, today. And and for me, it's like you know, statistics are there, and it's and it's a good way to gauge, and and it's great to inventory these things because one, you can learn from them, and then as a pastor, it's like I could look at that, and that's what I, I enjoyed. I'm looking at all of these things. It's like how can we structure this pastorally, administratively? How can we employ this in family dynamics, and how can we reach out? within the parish boundaries to all the corners of the parish boundaries, making sure that we at least have contact to listen mm -hmm. and be able to provide charity in the name of Christ. Because at times, if you just set up those, those efforts, you're going to have a healthy influx of people coming to the faith. Yeah. Now, Brandon, um, like I said, the most common things that all of the prayer requests that we've ever seen are healing and their children coming back or their grandchildren. Now, Brandon, unless something's changed and you've developed new powers, I don't think you know how to heal people yet, right? <laughs> working but, on it, but working haven't on it. figured it out yet. Yeah. yeah. But you do know how to help people get their children to return to the church or their grandchildren. So would you tell everyone about this awesome offer you put together uh, for, around the return book and then the catechetical tools that go along with that? For our awesome listeners. For our awesome <laughs> listeners, because everyone knows, Brandon, this is your fifth time on, and you what know now, is... you don't come on without giving our, uh, our viewers a good deal. Better than... <laughs> be like, nice. Be yeah, nice. Be good to them, right? <laughs> like, better than you would offer if you were on, like, Frad's show or whoever's <laughs> show, right? <laughs> Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that this is the book that I wrote that we've been talking about. It's titled Return, How to Draw Your Child Back to the Church, written especially for parents and grandparents who have seen loved ones uh, leave the faith. But really, it's for anyone who has a family member, friend, coworker who's left the church and wants to draw them back. And as I mentioned earlier, I, we've sold over 100,000 copies of this book, so we've sold more than enough copies to pay for the production of the book. Um, so what I've decided to do is to give away copies for free to viewers of the Catholic Talk Show. Um, and here's how it works. I will pay for the cost of the book, so I will give you the book for free. You just cover the shipping and handling, which is $6.95. Um, so I cover the book, you cover the shipping, and the book will be mailed to your home. And then in addition, um, I also have a online platform we've talked about here before on the show called Claritas U, which is designed to help Catholics talk about hot button issues with clarity and confidence. Things like atheism, transgenderism, abortion, homosexuality. How do we convey the Catholic position winsomely and persuasively? So in addition to the book, I'm also going to throw in a month of access to Claritas U, where you can watch all of these video courses that I teach on all these various issues. So you get the book, you get a month of Claritas U, all for free. You just pay the $6.95 shipping and handling, and I'll mail the book to you. That's the deal we were looking for. That's a deal of a lifetime. That right really there. is. That's excellent. And I really love that Claritas U is there because you're going to have these conversations with the people who fall away. And they're like, I just don't like how they treat gay people. And mm -hmm. I don't agree with the church on abortion. I, you know, I'm pro uh, choice or whatever. And part of this conversation that you're going to be having with these people is having the catechetical and I guess the ap ap apologetical skills to be able to answer these. You know, you can get, it's you can not find just it. that, though. It's also listening, because like a lot of what, what he draws his information in Claritas, you and and pretty much everything 
is entering into understanding where the person's coming right. from. You know, which I think is great. Yeah, you know, it's it's much needed. And that's what I'm saying. This offer provides both. It provides yeah. how to listen and how to diagnose, but then also how to c- converse around this so that when you're challenged or they say, well, okay, maybe I'll listen. You've listened to me. Here's my problem. You can then give a good answer back, right? So it's kind of the full kit kind of needed here. So if you go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash return, you can get this offer. It'll take you directly to it. So you get the book and the month of Claritas U for $6.95 shipping and handling. That's a great deal. That's excellent. Well, Brandon, it is always such a joy to have you here at the Catholic Talk Show. We're looking forward to this next shoot, and we keep on talking about I have, I've got a broken basketball hoop over here at my parish. <laughs> We're bringing in a brand new hoop because I want to see a one-on-one match between you and Delacross and and see, you know, I think we're going to do some I'm side either. bets on this, I, uh, on this I'm, game. I'm taking action on that. <laughs> Just make sure there's ice somewhere for my knees. <laughs> Golly. That'll be the bonus episode. Well, hey guys, I, I always love being with you. And this is number five, right? You said at the I beginning. So, so yeah. I, I need to I need to keep my grip strong on the most frequent <laughs> guest title. All right. Again, so go to CatholicTalkShow.com forward slash return to take advantage of this deal. The book return and the month of Claritas U for six ninety five shipping and handling. Brandon, always a pleasure. Well, to all of Delighted. our friends out there in the social media world on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, we're sending out content practically on the daily basis. And to our show and our followers on YouTube and all of the audio feeds that we're out on Podbean, I mean, that's one of my favorite personal ones. Well, that's where all the people, when they leave the show, they go to Podbean. They go to Podbean. Yeah. Along, and the nuns go to Podbean. The puns really. go that's to why Podbean. we're trying to reach out to it the is. nuns on Podbean and, <laughs> and proclaim the good news. And it's a joy to proclaim the good news with you guys. We're looking forward to reading your comments. And we'll see you all next week. God bless.